Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. If you like American Catholic History, become a supporter at Locals or Patreon. We've got some great perks for supporters, including interviews, gifts, live discussions, and even items we pick up on our travels. For more, visit our website, AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Help us keep this going. <laughs> also, be sure to give us a five-star rating and a great review at Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. These help others to find us. Today, we're talking about Jack Kerouac. Kerouac was the author of a number of books, most notably his 1957 magnum opus, On the Road. Kerouac is a complex character, to put it mildly. He lived life hard, he tried everything he could try, and did it all in his search for God. His life reminds me of the Hillbilly Thomas song, Weight of Eternal Glory. I love that song. And also Natalie Merchant. Well, yeah. Sorry, can never hear Kerouac without Natalie Merchant going through my head. Yeah. Anyways, The Weight of Eternal Glory is a great song. We really love it. It's about people living through hard times in their lives, but despite the pain, they hang on to their hope in God. Which, yes, really is a succinct way to put it vis-a-vis -vis Jack Kerouac. He was a haunted soul who kept looking for God in all the wrong places, even though he always knew exactly where to find him, and he ultimately did return. And along the way, he turned his own angst and search for God into one of the most significant cultural movements of the 20th. 20th century. Yeah, he was one of a core group of writers and artists who spawned the Beat Generation. And later in life, a journalist asked him that if he really was a Christian like he claimed, why didn't he write about Jesus? Kerouac replied, you're an insane phony. All I write about is Jesus. Which is a weird thing to think about when you experience his subjects and his treatment of them. Hedonism and restlessness reign. But he said his book On the Road was really a story about two Catholic buddies roaming the country in search of God. And we found him. So there's a sense in which his approach is similar to Flannery O'Connor, find beauty within the grotesque. But that fits with his life. He had a childhood trauma. He more or less abandoned the faith. He was married three times. He had significant substance abuse problems. But in the end, he had that faith that he came back to, and it was there for him. Okay, so we've kind of rambled around Kerouac's life for a bit. Let's talk about more detail from the beginning. He was born Jean-Louis Kerouac in 1922 in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is actually not far from where I grew up, just about 40 minutes away. And also like me, he has French-Canadian blood, but he was entirely French-Canadian. Well, for me, it's just on my mom's side through my grandfather. By the way, we told my grandfather's story in episode 100. Yes, and he was the third of his parents' three children. He had an older brother named Gerard and an older sister named Caroline. His parents were Catholic, his mother was very devout, and he grew up serving Mass. But when he was just four years old, his older brother, Gerard, died of rheumatic fever. This was a cataclysmic event in their family life. Gerard was a very good kid. The nuns who were nursing him through his final illness regarded him as a living saint. When he died, Kerouac's mother clung even more closely to the faith to deal with the grief. Unfortunately, Kerouac's father did not take this course. He abandoned the faith and drowned his sorrows in alcohol and gambling. Young Jack was deeply affected by both of these reactions for the rest of his life. Yeah, now this is something that I can really relate to. I am the oldest of seven, but one of my sisters died when she was six and I was 15. It was especially hard for my brother, who was two years younger than her. And the family is just never the same after something like that happens. Each person reacts and changes in unpredictable ways. All we can do is pray that everyone clings to hope rather than anger and despair. Fortunately, in my family, that's been the case. But but it seems in Kerouac's family, his parents went in opposite directions in this. And Jack was so young when it happened, he was really not capable of understanding what was going on or what it meant. But he grew up very much in the shadow of his older brother's death. The next major spiritual event in his life happened a few years later. He was he made his first confession when he was six. He was praying the rosary in the church after his confession when he heard a voice, which he later said was God. The voice told him that he had a good soul, that he would suffer in life and die in pain and horror. But in the end, he would find salvation. That's kind of an arresting message for a six-year-old. It's crazy. Yeah. Jack uh, didn't have a chance, I yeah, think. Yeah, really. He was a sensitive soul, and he grew up observing, on the one hand, his drunk, angry father with a gambling problem, and on the other hand, his very devout mother, who venerated her dead son as a saint. I mean, Gerard died at nine with the benefit of the sacraments, and by all accounts, his was a holy death, so it's 
really not a stretch to say that Gerard was in heaven. No, certainly not. And later in life, Jack said that he viewed Gerard as something of a guardian angel throughout his life. But the spirit of Gerard couldn't keep Jack from going through his own period of doubt and torment. He stopped going to mass in his teens and dropped most outward appearances of being Catholic. Jack was a good athlete in high school, excelling in football and wrestling. He won a partial scholarship to Columbia based on his football prowess, but his sports career came to an end after a broken leg, and that forced him to drop out of Columbia. He lost his scholarship. But he remained in New York City, living with his girlfriend. This was when he met most of the people who would become the progenitors of the Beat Generation along with him, and who would become characters in his novels. Allen Ginsberg, Neil Cassidy, John Holmes, Herbert Hunk, Lucien Carr, and William Burroughs among them. During World War II, he joined the Merchant Marines and then the U.S. Navy. It was around this time when he was about 20 years old that he wrote his first novel called The Sea is My Brother. This book was not published, however, until 2011, 70 years after it was written, because Kerouac thought that it was crock as literature, his words. But it really lays the groundwork for everything that would follow. It was about man's simple revolt from society as it is with the inequalities, frustrations, and self-inflicted agonies. Again, Kerouac's words. Right. So it's about a man who just feels beaten down. <laughs> Yeah, and you're jumping ahead a bit in the story. Yeah. But Kerouac's military career was not a long one. He was only on active duty in the Navy for eight days before he was given a medical discharge because of a schizoid personality. He said at the time that he just couldn't handle Navy life. He just liked to be on his own. So now he was back in New York City and he got married. Well, sort of. Okay, not really. Yeah. The reason he got married, quote unquote, was because he was arrested as an accessory to a murder. There's no need to go into the details, but he helped to destroy some evidence. The marriage took place because his father refused to post his bail, so he and his girlfriend got married so that her father would post his bail. That marriage only lasted a few years, and it was annulled by the church. Yeah, obviously it wasn't a valid marriage at all. The nullification was more or less just paperwork. After this marriage ended in the late 40s, he soon moved back in with his parents. During this time, lots of things happened. First, he wrote his first novel to be published, The Town and the City. Second, he coined the phrase, Beat Generation. And third, this is when he took the cross-country road trips with Neil Cassidy that would become his major novel, On the Road. Regarding the term Beat Generation, Kerouac's original meaning in using that term was to indicate how his generation just felt beat down. They lived in the prosperity and strictness of the post-World War II era, but felt constricted and disaffected by it all. They thought it all phony, inauthentic. They saw repression within it, and they strove to live more authentic and free lives. This meant sexual libertinism, experimenting with drugs, <laughs> and copious amounts of alcohol. For Kerouac, the alcohol abuse became a significant problem, and it would eventually kill him. But also for Kerouac, the underlying tension that drove him was that search for peace which eluded him after his childhood traumas. Other members of the Beat Generation had their own demons that drove them, as can be seen in the different paths their lives eventually took. William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, etc. Not a high morality crew. No. But for Kerouac, this was a genuine search for God. In later years, Kerouac would change the significance of the word beat in Beat Generation, and the change reflects his own maturation. He later said that beat stood for beatific, as in the Beat Generation was yearning for the beatific, that is, the face of God. And this is the key to understanding Kerouac. He did everything doable and tried everything triable, as an old Arch Abbot once said, but he never lost his Catholic faith. And that faith was there to welcome him back when he was ready to return, and it is what, in the end, sustained him. Reminds me of what we said about Babe Ruth in episode 16 and Frank Capra in episode 127. Both of those major figures talked about how their Catholic faith was always a part of them. And while you may fail it and run away from it, it will never fail nor run away from you. So the Catholic faith is essentially the biggest rickroll of all time? Never going to give you up, let you down, run around, desert you? Or desert you. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Can't believe you didn't sing it. Oh, yeah. And and you're right, in a, in a sense. But Rick Astley isn't quite the writer that Jack Kerouac was. So here's how Kerouac put it. The Catholic Church is a weird church. Much mysticism is sown broad spread from its ritual mysteries till it extends into the very lies of its constituents and parishioners. 
But his return to the faith, that twitch upon the thread, as Chesterton and Waugh called it, would come many years later. Right. We're still in the early 1950s, and Kerouac is about to write On the Road. Yes. So back to that. The actual writing of On the Road was pretty much what you'd expect with this provenance. A manic depressive writer who was sustained by alcohol and amphetamines has a bunch of notes from a series of road trips that were filled with debauchery and licentiousness, and he's determined to write a novel out of it. A recipe for success. <laughs> Only in the hands of an incredibly skilled and dedicated writer, which Kerouac was. Yeah, for all of his problems, he was both of those. So after a number of failed attempts, in April of 1951, he holed himself up in his apartment with his pregnant second wife, he'd gotten married again along the way, and he began to type. To reduce interruptions, he taped a series of sheets of paper together into a 120-foot scroll, and he fed one end of it into his typewriter. He typed with abandon. His wife, Joan, brought him more amphetamines and alcohol and enough food, though he only ate enough to keep himself alive. After three solid weeks of writing his draft was complete. The result was more or less a stream of consciousness that holds little respect for punctuation and only slightly more respect for grammar. He presented the draft manuscript to several book publishers, but none would have it. They all said it was too shocking. The drug use and descriptions of various immoral activities, even if the public were ready for such shocking material, the publishing houses were sure that the government censors would pull it off the shelves and hit them with a fine for having published it. While he was searching for a publisher, he was still also searching for God, but not yet in the Catholicism of his youth. In the mid-1950s, he dabbled in Eastern mysticism and did serious studies of Buddhism. But his season of Buddhism didn't last long as his soul sought God through the manifest beauty of creation rather than through denying that there is either beauty or ugliness in creation. It was at the end of this dabbling in Buddhism that he wrote perhaps his most poignant book, the short work Visions of Gerard. As the name suggests, it is based on the life of his deceased, dearly beloved older brother Gerard. It is set in Lowell, Massachusetts, and in it he uses the saintly character of his older brother to explore how fragile life is, and themes like wisdom, suffering, innocence, evil, delight, and shock, as experienced by a child. It's almost like Gerard was the muse who brought him back from the nothingness of Buddhism to continue the search for beauty and thereby God. Yeah, and I kind of want to read Visions of Gerard now. In 1957, a publisher, Viking, finally took the chance on On the Road. But even at Viking, the editor wouldn't publish it without eliminating, or at least modifying, some of the most shocking bits. Also, for the sake of the reader, much-needed punctuation was included and some grammar rules were reinstated. Kerouac resented these assaults on his art. He wanted it all printed exactly as he'd done it, but at root, he wanted it published, so he accepted many of the changes. The book caused a sensation, unsurprisingly. It was adopted as the voice of the generation. It became the biography of the beach generation and an inspiration to the emerging hippie generation. Kerouac was a star overnight. But the reason for the stardom didn't sit well with Kerouac. What he saw was everyone seizing on the hedonism in the book and using it as a veritable guide for how to rebel against authority, almost a nihilist guidebook. But Kerouac's intention was much more Flannery O'Connor than Hunter S. Thompson. The point of the darkness was to show more brightly the inevitable glimmers of light, as well as the absurdity and pointlessness of evil. Kerouac said of On the Road, Neil and I were embarked on a journey through post-Whitman America to find that America and to find the inherent goodness in American man. It was really a story about two Catholic buddies roaming the country in search of God, and we found him. For Kerouac, then, the point to be taken from the book was that God and goodness could be found in the midst of the beatenness of his generation. Essentially, the beatenness could become beatitude if the seeker was honest and open. So when his work was seized on at the outset of the hippie movement as some sort of Bible, Kerouac was appalled. He rejected the nihilist tendencies of the hippies, and he especially rejected their communism. He was a Catholic and a conservative Republican, and would tell people so. But most Catholics, conservatives, and Republicans were not comfortable claiming him due to the drug use and loose living in his past and in his books. So as the 1950s ended and the 1960s began, he found himself famous and fetid, but isolated and without a cultural or political home. In one instance, he sat for a photo shoot for an article in Mademoiselle magazine. But when the magazine hit the shelves, the editors had airbrushed out of the photo the crucifix he was wearing around his neck. He wrote a long essay decrying this decision, and in it he said, I am a beat. That is, I believe in beatitude and that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to it. 
Yeah, this was a man whose journal hardly had a page without a cross drawn in it or a prayer scribbled down. The pivotal moment, the turning point for his religious experience, really happened in 1960. He was staying for a time in a borrowed cabin by himself. He had an experience of irrational terror that his friends and associates were actually trying to poison him. This terror ended when he received what he described as a vision of the Blessed Mother and the cross of Christ surrounded by angels. Overcome, he said, I am with you, Jesus, for always. Thank you. And with that, the prodigal son's journey home had begun. As the 1960s moved along, the core members of the Beat Generation drifted apart. As Allen Ginsberg drifted towards communism in the mid-1960s, Kerouac, who was once very close friends with Ginsberg, took to denouncing him in rather strident terms. And later in his life, Kerouac flatly rejected the term beatnik, telling reporters, I'm not a beatnik. I'm a Catholic. In 1963, he was asked if the Catholicism in Visions of Gerard was something new for him. Kerouac, by this point fed up with people just not getting it, responded that all of his novels were Catholic at root. And then in a very Emmaus Road sort of way, he walked this interviewer through all of them one by one. He concluded the litany with, I'm born a Catholic and it's nothing new with me. I always carry my rosary. In 1964, he complained about his former allies. These beatnik poets have been insulting Jesus and the Virgin Mary right and left for the last six years in poems. And if anyone insulted Jesus in his presence, he would exclaim, ah, he died for bums like you. In 1966, two major events happened in the life of Jack Kerouac. First, his mother suffered a debilitating stroke. His father had died years earlier. And second, Kerouac got married for the third time. To clarify, his second wife, Joan, had left him in 1951, just weeks after he completed the first draft of On the Road, and she gave birth to their daughter, raising her without Jack. Jack's third wife, the only one he legitimately married in the church, was Stella Sampas. Now, this is really just the providence of God, frankly, but Stella Sampas was the younger sister of a close childhood friend of Jack Kerouac's, Sebastian Sampas. Stella and Sebastian were two of ten children in their family. Sebastian was a poet, and he was killed in World War II, so another traumatic loss in Jack Kerouac's young life. But Jack remained in contact with the Sampas family throughout his life. In 1966, Stella Sampas was the live-in caretaker for Jack's mother after her stroke. Jack had moved back in with his mother, so in a way, all of this was a huge coming home for Jack Kerouac. He was returning to the faith, he moved back in with his mother, who had been such a huge influence on his life, and he married a childhood friend from Lowell. And Stella was good for him, it seems. In 1968, journalist Ted Berrigan came to the Kerouac house to do an interview for the Parish Review. Kerouac had previously arranged for the interview, but when Berrigan arrived, Stella wouldn't let him in, or his companion. She angrily assumed that they were just another couple of people looking for a brush with fame, and they just wanted to be able to say that they had gotten drunk with THE Jack Kerouac. It took some convincing, but Stella finally relented and let them in but only for 20 minutes. Well, as it became clear that these men were seriously interested in her husband in a healthy way, she became much more hospitable. This was the interview we mentioned at the outset. It was Berrigan who asked Kerouac why, if he were really a Christian, he didn't write about Jesus more. And Kerouac probably miffed the journalist of Berrigan's caliber hadn't done his research to see what he had said about his own writing so many times shot back, you're an unbelievable phony. All I write about is Jesus. One of his final public appearances was on the interview show Firing Line, hosted by the one and only William F. Buckley. On the panel with Kerouac was a hippie activist named Ed Sanders. The discussion covered the meaning and effectiveness of the hippie movement and the roots of it in the beatnik movement. Kerouac took the opportunity to denounce that hippies were in any way a legitimate offspring of his beat generation movement. He insisted upon his Catholicism during the show, declared he always voted for Republicans, and took an opportunity to address Sanders directly. He looked at Sanders, who had been advocating for various sit-ins and other protests against this and that, and he said, quote, I made myself famous by writing songs and lyrics about the beauty of the things I did and the ugliness too. You made yourself famous by saying, down with this, down with that, throw eggs at this, throw eggs at that. Then Kerouac gestured dismissively and said, take it with you. I cannot use your refuse. You may have it back. This was kind of a valedictory for him. He's done. He has his faith and a caring wife. Now he needs to do some things to get his health back in order. Alas, that was not to be. On the morning of October 20th, 1969, Kerouac felt sick and went to the bathroom where he began vomiting blood. The years, decades of heavy drinking caught up with him. A hemorrhage somewhere in his throat or stomach had erupted. 
He was rushed to the hospital and given transfusions, but the damage to his internal organs, particularly his liver, was so severe that the bleeding could not be staunched. At 5.15 a.m. the next day, October 21st, Jack Kerouac, the long-suffering and misunderstood cultural icon, died. He had a Catholic funeral mass at St. Jean-Baptiste Church in Lowell, Massachusetts on October 24th, 1969. Present were many of his friends from the B generation whom he had drifted away from. In his hands as he lay in the casket was a rosary, just as he'd kept with him in life. Jack Kerouac had heard a voice immediately after his first confession when he was six, telling him that he would live a life of pain and suffering, and that he would die a horrible death. But that voice also assured him that he had a good soul, and he would in the end find salvation. The first two of those came to pass, certainly. With his return to the faith, we sincerely hope and pray that the last part did as well. This has been American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media and produced by the StarQuest Production Network. If you enjoy American Catholic History, become a supporter on Locals or Patreon. Get information about both and the perks of being a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about Jack Kerouac, see our upcoming pilgrimages, and find other episodes. And be sure to check out our sponsor, Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH 1513. I'm Noelle Hester Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media and produced by StarQuest. <laughs>